Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are coming to you live from Zartman House inside of the head of school office. My name is Doug Thornell. I'm from the fantastic class of 1995. <laughs> and I'm joined by a very special guest, the head of school, Brian Garman. Good to see you, Doug. As many of you know, Brian uh, came back to Sid Wolf Friends School as head of school in uh, the beginning of 2015. Prior to that, he was head of school at Wilmington Friends for eight years. And Brian has a long history here at Sidwell Friends School. Before Wilmington Friends, he was a history teacher here. He was the chair of the history mm -hmm. department. He also ran the summer studies program. He was associate head of school and he was the upper school principal. So Brian, on behalf of everyone at the Sidwell Friends community, welcome back. And also thank you for participating in the first ever Sidwell Friends online interactive town hall. We're making history. We are going to make history. It's We're right. It's great history. to be back. I've had a great five months, um, and everything I missed about this place is still intact, and it's just been wonderful to be here. Great. So this is part of Brian's Room 212 tour. It's, been, it's a tour that Brian's been on for several months now where he's been crisscrossing the country, meeting with alumni and friends and former students. It's a way to welcome Brian back to the community and for him to reconnect with uh, some old friends and some old students. Uh, a couple items before we get to the questions. Uh, we are gonna be taking questions live. So on your screen, if you're watching, you can type a question into the question box and hit uh, 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 click ask a question. You can also ask a question by uh, emailing townhall at sidwell.edu. We will try to get to as many as we possibly can. We also had some questions that were submitted before today that we'll run through. So with that, let's get going. All Brian, right. I'm gonna take the liberty of asking the first question. It's actually a combination of a question that I have and Michael Bacon from the class of 1984 has. And the, my question is, what does it mean to you to be back at Sidwell Friends? And Michael's question is, how has Sidwell Friends changed since you were last here? Yeah, it's as Ed was saying, it's it's just great to be back. And one of the things that's been most rewarding has been uh, to go across the country and see the alumni, uh, and and to see students that I've taught uh, lead their adult lives. And what is so extraordinary is listening to the consistency in how they describe the school. They always talk about the difference that faculty made in their lives. They talk about the impact that uh, Quaker education had on them. And they always point to, uh, to the importance of financial aid, providing financial aid to the spirit of the school, which I think really speaks to the depth of character of, of our students, but also to the way in which they absorb the values of the place. So, um, and I tell the students that I, I see my former students how much fun it is, how rewarding it is to see what they're doing with their lives. All of our alumni do such amazing things and truly let their lives speak. So that's been very rewarding. There certainly are uh, uh, parents, former parents, uh, that I've had a chance to reconnect with and former colleagues, which has been great fun. In terms of what's changed, the school, um, the spirit of the school, I think, is very similar to what it was when I left. Uh, it's a little larger than it was. The upper school has probably 30 or 40 more students in it than when I was here. The other divisions have remained mostly the same. The school is much more diverse than it was when I was here. I would say that um, when I left nine years ago, the um, percentage of students of color was somewhere between 25 and 30 percent, and now it's almost 50 percent. It's on the high 40s, and that's been wonderful. There were no, there was not an organization uh, like the parents of Latino students, and and that's a vibrant part of our community now, and that's really wonderful. The facilities are different, uh, and uh, Bruce Stewart did a They're remarkable better. voting. They're a little better. I don't know if you, well, you you were an athlete. Do you remember that weight room that we used to have oh, underneath yeah, like a closet, <laughs> the closet uh, uh, lined with bench presses? Yes, exactly. So. So um, this wonderful um, athletic facility, the meeting for worship room is really wonderful and was just certified uh, lead platinum. Uh, so that's the second platinum uh, building we have attesting to the uh, environmental mission of the school. Uh, the middle school is the other building. But that's just, there's something about the character of that room that changes meeting for worship, the quality of meeting for worship. And, uh, you know, it was, we could have a good meeting in the gym before that, but it's much nicer to have it in, in that space. So those are, are two items that are uh, particularly different. I think also um, 
there, there are some curricular changes that I can talk about later. I think there's some people who want to talk about those, so maybe we'll save that for later. But uh, again, the spirit of the place feels very much like it did. People, uh, and, and working with this latest group of seniors, which I only knew for five months, has, was a, a great experience for me because it felt like the kids I used to, to work with in, right. in a very uh, genuine way. And I, I'll never forget my first day on the job here when two students came over from the senior class to see me, uh, Jerome and Stephanie. And that just made a big impact on me that they would take the time to do that. And it also spoke, I think, to the character of that class, just how friendly they are. Uh, so we had a wonderful graduation celebration a week Last ago today. Week, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. And unfortunately, it rained. But alumni will be happy to know that the class of 2015 still walked down the stairs of behind Zartman House. That was very important to them. And actually, at reunion, we had a lot of uh, alumni who wanted to retrace those steps down the stairwell. But we had uh, two great commencement speakers, uh, Elsa Walsh and Bob Woodward, who had a daughter in the class, Diana. And uh, Elsa spoke very eloquently about the importance of kindness, uh, that any regret that she had in her life, she said, had to do with a moment where she didn't embrace the opportunity to be kind. And, and that was, I thought, just really wonderful advice to give. Um, and Bob, of course, spoke about um, the importance of being engaged in politics, being aware of politics, and being um, you know, a very active citizen. So great, great remarks uh, for a great class. And uh, we'll hope next year's outside. <laughs> Weather permitting. Right. Uh, I want to um, follow up on a topic you mentioned, diversity, because a number yeah. of uh, questions that we, we received asked about the issue of diversity. Right. Cal Hoffman from 76, Camilo Acosta, Simon Chabel from 97, yeah. Bruce Altavote. They all want to know what the school is doing to maintain its commitment to diversity, particularly regarding increasing his, uh, Hispanic enrollment, right. uh, making civil friends more affordable to the middle class, and, um, and making it more accessible to different socioeconomic um, and regional groups. These are great questions. I actually saw Camillo uh, when I was out in LA and had a chance to talk with him about this. Actually, the Camillo was in San Francisco. But um, at any rate, you know, one, one of the things that's important in terms of uh, diversifying the student body is uh, to get a critical mass of diversity. And we've been able to work toward that, um, especially more recently uh, with uh, Latino students. Uh, and the fact that we now have this vibrant parent organization has been very helpful to us because they're actually helping us recruit students, and that's, that's great. Um, and we have also uh, really increased our inve uh, investment in the diversity program here at Sidwell. We have just appointed a director of equity, uh, justice, and community, and the goal of that, we had a, a, a quarter-time position that was an all-school diversity director, but what we want to do is really work toward um, investing in creating a very inclusive community, making sure all of our families feel welcome here, making sure that um, we are raising questions about social justice and equity, both within the community and outside of the community. Uh, and we have hired a great person named Philip McAdoo, who um, actually had a career on Broadway. Um, and a, a leading role in The Lion King, played um, junior varsity basketball at the University of North Carolina, and uh, is just a, an extraordinarily personable guy who's coming in to start in July. We're also um, expanding positions in the admissions office to deepen our commitment to recruiting students from across the city, and, and we have what is what we're calling an admissions outreach person who um, is uh, trying to uh, go out in neighborhoods that are primarily underserved and finding students who would thrive at Sidwell Friends. So that's another important part These are all of our strategy. New These are new positions, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, we actually received a grant from the E.E. E. Ford Foundation to help fund these positions. That's great. So, um, yeah, we're very happy about that. So that's uh, one piece that um, is very important, um, uh, or a way we're responding to the, the ongoing commitment that the school has had to diversity. And, and the fact that we have uh, almost 50% students of color. To it's me, incredible. it's really it's really exciting because we're talking about having um, a majority non-white nation by what 2040 is right. what the demographers are saying, and um, Not we to mention being in a city that is incredibly cosmopolitan, right. um, incredibly diverse, and it really gives us an opportunity to model what that society should look like. And um, I can't think of a better opportunity for a school. 
to have that opportunity to teach kids about how, how to work in the future world, uh, right. the, the um, country that we'll have. And it's so important to uh, democracy, the health of democracy, I think, and so important to the mission of Quaker education. That's great. Um, so Joseph Shin from the class Joey. of uh, 2005 wants to know about what are the areas in, of improvement for the school to work yeah. on? One, one thing that I would say to, to Joey, um, and uh, this goes back to the previous question too, one of the things that we need to work on is growing the endowment because that's, that's something that will help make the school more affordable to middle class families. So that picks up the last question also. And how can the friend, our friends watching do that? Well, they could give to the endowment. <laughs> Thanks for the setup. <laughs> No, but that really, truly, I mean, I, I think uh, that the world desperately needs Quaker education. Um, and I think that we have a responsibility to make that education as accessible to people as we possibly can. And I, I've spoken before at, at some uh, forums that, uh, you know, our, our democracy is very bifurcated. Um, it's hard to find consensus in the world. Uh, it's hard to find peace in the world. It's hard to find a place where people can reflect on matters in a serious way in the world. And, and Friends Education teaches kids to do that. Uh, and we need to make that, that kind of education has had such an impact on the lives of our alumni. And I think more broadly um, in the world, the, I think that Sidwell Friends has to continue a, a deep commitment to make that uh, education accessible to as many people as possible. And one of the things we want to focus on is um, making it accessible, not just in terms of tuition, but continuing to work on providing all the full range of services and opportunities uh, to students who are on aid as those who are um, not receiving aid or uh, benefit from. And, and another place that we want to do that is in um, providing funds for students to travel internationally. We think that's uh, a great part of our program. It's a growing part of our program. And we want to be able to make that accessible to all students uh, as well. So that's, that's a challenge for us. I think the, other, uh, the financial model of independent schools, of universities, is a, is a challenging situation right now. It's, this is nothing new. Everybody's talking about it. Um, and I think the other challenge that a school like Sidwell has uh, given the level of success that we've enjoyed, uh, you know, during during our time, is that you don't want to fall victim to complacency, and so um, making sure that we're always growing, that we're looking at education in that deeply Quaker way of continuing revelation, uh, that we can't sit still and we can't be static. And fortunately, we have a faculty that always wants to learn. Uh, we cannot keep enough professional development funds for our faculty because they exhaust them all the time. And it's, it, it's, it, when I think about uh, what I enjoy about this place, it is that deep intellectual engagement uh, of faculty in the entire community and this, this desire to want to, to grow. The faculty here was always very important to me when I was a student, yeah. and I know my classmates we still have relationships with some of the right. teachers yeah, that, sure. that taught us here. Right. What are your thoughts on how you keep talent here and how do yeah. you attract talent? It's a, well, professional development is one way to do that, to provide generous funds. We have some uh, what are called the venture grant funds that provide um, up to $20,000 of, uh, of money for summer grants, and these are for uh, group projects. These are um, funded by uh, an alumni family. Uh, very important to the um, health of the school and to the growth of our faculty. And, and there are other professional development opportunities, faculty travel grants. Um, uh, we saw uh, recently uh, a faculty member in the middle school talk about how important it was for him to be able to go to the coast of Greece and see where the odyssey were, uh, took place, right, and how that re-energized his class. Um, we've seen uh, presentations from uh, a lower school art teacher who talked about her travels across Europe and was able to show directly the kind of impact that had on her teaching. Uh, so those are, those are crucial to uh, the retention and the recruitment of faculty. The other thing that we always have to keep our eye on, especially in a city that's as expensive where the cost of living is as high as Washington, is the faculty salaries. Um, and that's another reason to add to the endowment so that we can continue to attract um, the very best faculty and to continue to pay them um, at the levels that they deserve to be paid. And there's no more crucial resource to the school than, than the faculty. And, um, and you can, the alumni will attest to that. Yeah. Um, every, every, every conversation I have with alumni, that comes up. Right. Uh, Lisa Harris-Moorhead, she's from the class of 1968. 
and she asks, how will you preserve students' rights to freely express themselves here at Sidwell Friends? Voice is such an important part of Sidwell and such an important part of, important part of Quakerism when you think about uh, the, the um, structure of Quaker meeting, right? All voices are equal and you have a responsibility to make your voice feel heard. So we encourage that voice here at the school. Um, we want people to let their lives speak in their actions. There are all kinds of publications where students are um, able to speak out. The Horizon is uh, one place where they express that voice. We have a new magazine actually that focus on, focuses on um, issues of diversity at the school. Uh, I just have on my desk here the latest uh, uh, edition of Quarterly. Uh, which is still thriving. And if you were to take it at the end of the year, there were extraordinary um, art displays, art um, installations in the, in the new building. And um, you can see uh, the, the seriousness and the playfulness, um, and in some cases, the political import and impact with which our students speak. Um, and, and even- Is it harder in the social media age that we're in where a lot yeah. of the, a lot of the students have Instagram, they may have Twitter and that, you know, the... Yeah, that, that, that can be difficult. I mean, and I, think it, I think it's difficult in the social dynamic, uh, particularly in middle school, that can become a problem where uh, bullying has kind of migrated into the digital space. And so we do spend time talking with families about that, how to... Um, regulate that kind of conversation with their kids. Sometimes we get pulled into that because it has an impact on the way in which a, a child is learning in school. And what I always say is that parents really need to try to understand the digital world that their kids are living in and that they ought to experiment with some of these uh, digital uh, platforms. Get an Instagram account, get a Twitter account, um, look at Tumblr, uh, and, and know where your kids could be living. And um, I, think, I think we have a responsibility as educators to be familiar with those kind of platforms. But um, as parents, and I, I feel this very strongly as a parent myself, that I need to know that too. I need to know uh, where my kids might be living digitally. Right. So you posed a query before, this, yeah. um, before the town hall, and it was, what essential values and components of the Sidwell Friends experience should a head of school protect? Yeah. So I want you to What's answer special? your own. You want me to answer? Yeah. I think that, um, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to faculty at the end of the year and was saying that there was a reason why uh, Jim Zug, who wrote the history of Sidwell, School, uh, Sidwell Friends School, the latest history, entitled his book The Long Conversation. Right? And, and I think there is always a conversation about what Sidwell is and what it should be about. But at the heart of that conversation, there are certain things I think that you need to protect. Um, one is the uh, intense climate of intellectual inquiry, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's absolutely central to what this school is about. That's why it is a conversation, uh, because this is a place where people have uh, great ideas, there's great talent, and um, there's something about what's forged in those conversations, in the heat of those conversations in many cases, that makes this place very special. I think, too, there is um, the, the um, connection of that intense intellectual life with the spirit of Quakerism that makes this place e even, even um, more un so unique, uh, especially in the landscape of schools in Washington. Uh, that commitment to let your life speak, that commitment to um, using your talents to have an impact on the world. Tell us a little bit. Let yeah. your life speak. You've used that term yeah. a lot of times yeah. for folks who aren't yeah. familiar with it. Yeah. There's actually a day where right. there is a let your life speak yeah. session where past Sidwell right. friends students come to the school and talk about what they're doing with their yeah, careers. Yeah, exactly. And the, the Let Your Life Speak quote comes from George Fox, uh, the founder of Quakerism, uh, who always was very clear that what you do is more important than what you say. Right. How you how you live your life is more important. And, and we've had um, students, uh, for alumni come back uh, at Founders Day this year. Uh, we had about 20 alumni come back at their own expense and speak about what they're doing with their lives. And maybe somebody who's doing, somebody who's working on an organic farm at Yale, uh, someone who's in the public defender's office, someone who's doing all kinds of uh, work to protect the environment. Uh, <clears throat> someone who um, was actually featured uh, doing a lot of mountain climbing and, and um, echo awareness work. <clears throat> and, and so they come 
to provide an example to our students on Founders Day. But there's so many ways to give back. Um, and we, I've had a conversation with an alum recently about this um, that she said, well, does Quakerism allow for our alumni to succeed in uh, more conventional paths, such as the law, or as she was especially interested in business. And one of the things um, that has been written out of the history of Quakerism, Quakerism is that Quakers uh, were very successful in business and <clears throat> brought a particular ethics to bear on uh, the relationships that they had in their businesses. So um, people would be surprised to know that Macy's were Quakers. Um, that uh, uh, Joseph Wharton, after whom uh, Wharton Business School was named, was a Quaker. Clark Shoes, Barclays Bank, Lloyd of London, Cadbury's. Uh, and and uh, we're hoping actually to organize a, a conversation about this um, and to have our alumni who, are, who have been successful in business um, and uh, social entrepreneurs to come in, uh, to the school and have a, a conference about this. And we're looking forward to that in the future too. So another way to let your life speak um, in how you interact with people uh, in your business and on, on, in your everyday life and how especially those Quakers who were successful in business were also major philanthropists who gave their um, excess earnings to social causes. We had a, a, a close to a dozen people ask a version of this, this question which is um, are, are students able, and you touched on it briefly yeah. in your answer, but are students able to communicate the basic Quaker uh, testimonies and values <clears throat> after they graduate. Somebody asked me that question recently in a parent meeting, you know, how, to what extent are they really well versed in, in Quaker tenets? And I, I think that um, for me it has to, my gauge of it has a lot to do with the Let Your Life Speak quote from George Fox. I think that if you look at the senior class, for example, and the relationships that they have with one another, if you look at how our students treat one another, um, if you look at how they respond to um, poignant moments in the life of the school with silence, you can see that Quakerism uh, is alive and well. I gave the example recently at, at a parent meeting. He asked me, how, how do you know it works? And I spoke about one of the most powerful moments uh, in my life, actually, when, which happened when um, Tyler Roosh was killed in a car accident the day before school began. Um, and I was upper school head. And, you know, nobody knew what to do because we were so stricken with grief. Uh, everybody came to the campus and we just opened the meeting room and sat there and no one said anything for an hour. And um, I remember the first day of school, which was the next day, and we, you, you know, as you, you probably recall, that that first day always had. Uh, always began with a meeting for worship. And again, uh, in that hour, no one spoke. It was just, but there was a, a real intense feeling of community and just being together, a need to be together. And then the regularly scheduled meeting on Thursday took place, which was an hour and a half celebration of Tyler's life where people couldn't stop speaking. And it was just so poignant to see how the community pulled together at that moment. Um, and how they knew how to use uh, that space of meeting for worship uh, to, to deepen the strength of the community and to process something that was so deep and profound and, and sad. Uh, so I think, and I think people carry that with them uh, when they leave. I, you know, it's so often we talk to our alumni who uh, when they first get to college, uh, or not, maybe not when they first get there, but within a couple of months, they're looking for a Quaker meeting because they miss that experience in some right. sense. So I do think that part of the school um, is very vibrant, very vital, um, and, and is meaningful to our alumni. So classmates Mary Ann McGrill from class of 76 and then Cal, Cal Hoffman both asked about curriculum. curriculum, curriculum. Mm -hmm. They want to know how does the curriculum engage each student's process of inquiry and learning and are there any plans for changes in or evaluation of the curriculum yeah. used? Well, one of the things that we're doing um, this coming year is to start what's called the self-study. So we are accredited, or accredited by the um, Association of Independent Maryland Schools and we 
study the curriculum, take a year-long process to study the curriculum, and then there's a visiting team that comes and reads our report um, and then makes recommendations moving forward. So there'll be some conversation about the curriculum there. But there's been, uh, again, something that's changed since I've been here, some really significant innovation in the curriculum, uh, some interdisciplinary work that I find very exciting. I, did, I watched um, the sixth grade team in the middle school work through this amazing project this year where the, the goal was to have students design a sustainable uh, uh, house, a home, um, in various regions of the country. So maybe one group would have to design it in a desert setting, another in a mountain setting, um, you know, another in an urban setting. And it was very interdisciplinary. They had to build models. They had to assess, um, you know, heat transfer index indices and, 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 you know, very technical scientific information and then present uh, uh, their design uh, to a panel uh, at the end of that process. And it was really, I mean, this, this movement in education toward actually solving practical problems, I think, is a good one. And something that has been embraced more here recently than it was when I was here last time. The other thing, a couple of other programs that are really amazing is we are sending 12 students right now, they left uh, uh, on Wednesday, uh, to Rwanda on a four credit class. So they will receive academic credit there. They will be there for four weeks. Uh, it's not tourism. Right? It's, they're actually um, doing a lot of reading about the country. They're reading about its political infrastructure. They're studying the landscape. And they have to produce um, real meaningful projects about the trip. We're doing the same to Uruguay. We are have done that. Uh, these are, these are uh, students who are getting really credit for a sophomore level history class. Uh, they're ri rising to, to the junior year next year. Um, we have uh, also the, the Uruguay program, um, and we have uh, 12 students, 12 Sidwell students, who went to the China field semester, uh, which was the second semester of this past year, and they are studying in Yunnan province, uh, a rural area of China, uh, apprenticing themselves to traditional tradespeople in China, learning about the belief systems uh, in China, and also learning about the landscape and the environment of China as well. So we're really modeling a whole different way of learning in that, in that um, setting that's not textbook driven. One of the most fascinating things that I've seen this year had to do with a collaboration that was taking place with our engineering class. So we now have an engineering class and design class um, along with our African history class. So the two classes came together near the end of the year. The African history class was talking about the African diaspora and Shield Sundberg, who is the um, teacher who's taking the students to Rwanda. Shields has long had um, a relationship with a village in Haiti. And one of the challenges they have in this village is sustaining their bee population because when they uh, extract the honey from the hives, uh, they don't have honey extractors like uh, uh, beekeepers have here in the States. And so what happens is the base of the hive is destroyed and the bees dissipate and they've got to re rebuild the hive um, from the ground up. And so uh, in bringing these two classes together, Shields has asked the engineering class and the um, history class to work on designing a honey extractor from made of materials that are readily available in Haiti. And so they had, you know, they, they, she had somebody bring in some honey extractors so that they could see how these things work. And it was so much fun to sit in that classroom and watch, watch the students just take over the classroom and start drawing, uh, uh, you know, designs for um, a honey extractor on, on the whiteboard. Um, and, and they're actually going, they've, they've made some prototypes of uh, these extractors and Shields is hoping actually to take them to Haiti next spring break when she's planning to take a group of students there. So, so really, you know, the, these interdisciplinary projects uh, guided toward solving real world problems uh, is a really interesting move in education and one that I think um, fits very well with the mission of Sidwell Friends School. I always thought Sidwell was always when I was there one step of, ahead of every other yeah. school in terms of the types of classes you could take. And it seems that in the electives, yeah. And I know, think we I mean, still it, are, just, yeah. It seems like you know, it's a class like that. I mean, where else in, yeah. that th in bringing those two classes together for something so unique? I, it, yeah, and you got, you got, again, you got to take the hats off to the yeah. teachers on that for, for, for doing that. And the, the kids, too, are willing to take those risks and embrace that also, right. which is what you want to see. Um, I, I, you know, and we're still doing all the uh, 
terrific things that you know we've been doing for years in terms of uh, teaching great math skills and, and, and science skills and reading, uh, writing. You know, our, our kids write write incredibly well. And you know, it's interesting when I was out um, in San Francisco seeing alumni. There was I met one of my former students, Brian Kane, who had founded um, a company to sell tech companies. So really, what he does is once they want to um, sell themselves, he, you know, he's running a soup to nuts uh, services for them. And um, I said to him, "How did you come up with this idea?" And he said, "Well, we said, well, friend school." And it was because of the, in his estimation, the critical thinking skills that he had learned here, um, and uh, the ability to see possibilities where they don't necessarily exist. And uh, you know, that, that kind of thought, that kind of um, energy is such an important part of this place. Right, yeah, and it's something, back to the previous question about you know, the, how does a Quaker education serve you in the future, yeah. and it's one of the, I, I found one of the most important ways. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a couple questions from Nora Cameron, she's a parent of Alexander's class of 24, uh, and then a, a parent of an alumni uh, Claire Levy, they it, it gets into the work, issue of workload, uh -huh. which I think the school. Yeah, I, I remember when I was here. Did you have work? <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I couldn't find anyone to do my work. But um, the uh, it's 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 an intense school. Yeah, you know I mean, and I think it is. People, it's a it's a people. Uh, I think kids oftentimes feel like that. You know, there's just not yeah. enough day, number not enough right. hours in the day to get the work done, but. Their question is, how do we keep the school experience rich and rigorous without making the work level in the upper grades too crushing yeah. uh, that kids don't have a chance to explore other, you know, other experiences that they're, that they're interested in? It's a really interesting question. I think there's a, a lot of sides to this question. Um, you know, one, one is uh, talking to some alumni about it, they've really come to appreciate the you might call the intensity of the experience. They said, you know, I felt so prepared mm -hmm. when I was at college. They felt so prepared for their work. And they've, they've actually identified the rigor as, as being important. Uh, I think also, you know, there's a, there's a difference between um, rigor and workload, right? You can be, you can, you can think very rigorously about material without um, having to do uh, volumes of it, right? So I think that's one thing that we need to be um, cognizant of. I think the other thing that is important around this question is uh, cultural shifts that have taken place since you and I were in high school, let's say. Um, you know, the, the, we weren't, you and I were not as heavily scheduled uh, in our lives. Um, we didn't have, at least I didn't have, such regularly scheduled uh, programs where I was playing, you know, baseball here and playing piano here. Um, and getting my SAT coaching here, right? And so when we think about workload, I think we do have to think about setting um, reasonable boundaries in our lives, both on the school side, but also um, on the student side. Uh, I know that I have to make choices about how much I can do in any, at any given time. I know that I can serve on two other boards, but you know, that's my limit. Because if I do, try to do more than that, um, something is compromised. It may be my family life, uh, it may be my work life here. And so I think that one of the things that Sidwell has always tried to encourage students to do, and with varying degrees of success, is to make those choices. Um, and we do need to teach kids to make those choices sooner rather than later. You can't do it all. Um, and, and there's also, you know, it's funny that you mentioned this, I'm, and it's a little bit different context. I'm thinking back to graduate school now, and a professor who used to have a performance syllabus, and there was so much reading, right? You know, it was like, I don't know, 1,500 pages a week or something right. like And he'd say, I know there's too much reading. Figure out how to do it, right? And, he, and it, when he said that, he didn't expect us to read every page, right? There's something like that. So how, if we, we give the work, we also need to teach the kids how to make those selections about, right. you know, how to, how to get through the work efficiently. Right. I thought one, one of the one of my most one of my most favorite teachers at Sidwell who recently passed away. Neil. Neil. Yeah. Great, great guy. Yeah. Um, and it, w the way he would conduct his class, I mean, you almost felt like you were in a you know it was a, a kind of like a law class. Yeah. Where, yeah. You know, you would read right. the section, and we might spend 
20 minutes on just a couple pages. Yeah. Just talking through. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, what, you know, what does this mean? And, yeah. It, you know, and, and I felt like, and that's, an, I think, an example. You know, it's not a lot of workload, but yeah. the, the rigor of what we're thinking about. The rigor of the analysis. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I think back to your point about critical analysis, I mean, you really did get under the sheets in, in yeah. terms of what was this author talking about? Yeah. How did it yeah. play in the context of the times? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think Neil made me and I know the, my friends ready for college yeah. in terms yeah. of the sorts of advanced classes yeah. that yeah. we took yeah. in college. So yeah. the words mattered, right? Yeah. He taught you that. And yeah. that, that, right. And there was so much pressure on certain words, especially mm -hmm. in poetry, that, you know, you needed, that, that you needed to reckon with it. And, and Neil had a way of being sure that you reckon with with the words with the content and with the larger philosophical implications right so tell me what does the sports experience here at sidwell mean to you and what do you think it means yeah. to the larger sidwell community well i think it means a lot i i, I play sort of an important part of my life i think i told you this in another conversation that um you know my favorite high school teacher was my baseball coach um, and I learned a great deal from him, and my grandfather was a, a wonderful baseball coach too, and I think that's why I became interested in teaching. Uh, and I think you can learn uh, tremendous things on the athletic field that you can't elsewhere, and a lot of that has to do with character, a lot of that has to do with the sense of being part of the community. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, eliciting what is best in yourself in a different kind of context, and I, the, but one that can carry over. Um, to your career or to the work that you do in academics. I think it is also important, um, an important realm for uh, self-expression, to go back to another uh, question um, that was asked earlier, that uh, kids express their talents in different ways, and it's important to um, value all of the outlets, all of the talents that they have, and athletics is a, a, a place where certain students can do that. I think it creates a tremendous sense of, uh, can create a tremendous sense of school pride and, and spirit, uh, and I think that um, it's something that's very important to our alumni. Uh, the board has reaffirmed, I think, our commitment to uh, athletic uh, excellence here at the school, um, one that takes place in the context of academic excellence. And I've been talking about this a little bit because uh, the board just issued its athletic task force report. Um, and I'd encourage people to go to the website to look at that philosophy. And they, they say, it actually says that we encourage athletic excellence and academic excellence. In terms of, in, uh, what, what I've been doing is talking about um, Sidwell's athletic program really in, in the context of the, the NESCAC schools, you know, so Williams, Amherst, uh, Hamilton, schools that have, they want an outstanding athletic experience for their students, um, but they're going to do it within this context of academic excellence. I think that's our our peer group in a way in, right. in, in college. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the most important thing uh, in having a good athletic experience for our kids is, is the important thing, same thing as having a, an outstanding academic experience is the people matter. Right. Um, and, and you know, our coaches do, um, are, are so important in, in uh, making sure that the kids have a great experience and grow. It's not just about winning, it's about how they, they grow as human beings in that process. So um, I think it matters a great deal. So we only have a few more minutes. So if, you, if anyone has any questions, now's the time to type them in or email them. Uh, we're going to do a little mini uh, lightning round here. Okay. <laughs> uh, Katrina Cephas is a parent of Chancellor, who's the class of 2018, and she asks, is there anything that you will take from Wilmington Friends and bring to and implement here? At and it's interesting, Wilmington Friends was an international baccalaureate school, um, and so that was a different kind of program. There are certain um, aspects uh, that I would bring from Wilmington Friends, but since this is a lightning round, I would say one thing, and that is uh, I love what it does for its Martin Luther King Day celebration. Great. Neville Waters has a question, will you bring back Charlie's special? I want to know what Charlie's special is, and once I find out, I think I want to bring it back, um, because I like the idea of Charlie's special. The food is so incredible here now. You talk about another change, that's it um, yeah. also. And uh, so we have, the specials now tend to be, um, you know, foods from around the world. And, and so, uh, especially in the lower school, the food becomes part of the education program. I don't know if we, I think we've kind of touched on this, but the greatest challenge facing Sidwell Friends in the future. I think part of that is, has to do with all schools finding, the, you know, the right financial model for the schools. Um, 
and I think that the, the, another part of that question was what, what is a challenge for me in that? And I think that uh, you know, part of the challenge for me is always to keep the conversation going, the long conversation, um, and being present and listening and, and trying to um, discern the right path forward for the school amidst the uh, very uh, talented and uh, intense voices that we, we sometimes have. You mentioned that Bob Woodward yeah. uh, spoke at graduation. Kathy Webb, who's the class of 76, asked that uh, uh, Bob Woodward talk about the importance of politics and politicians in our lives, yet Quaker models of governance seem different than those of our yeah. current political system. Uh, are there opportunities for civil friend students to gain a practical experience in politics through the student government here or through other opportunities at the school? There are, there are and uh, you know, we'd like, we want our kids to be engaged. I love that word, engaged, engagement. Um, we want them to be politically engaged. And I think that's what Bob was trying to get them to see, that, it, that you know, he was saying the, the people who hold political office matter. Their views matter. You need to listen and you need to become engaged. And if you don't like what they're doing, you need to do something to change it. That's a very Quaker impulse. And I do think, and Kathy's question is a good one, I think also that our political system can benefit from people who have had Quaker educations again because I find just the system is just too polarized. The conversation is too polarized. We need some people who are going to try to bring, um, uh, to search for the truth wherever, wherever it is and, and to have the courage to do that and to try to bring this very polarized discourse together. Tell me, what are you looking forward to in 2016 or next school year? I'm looking forward to being here for an entire year. Uh, you know, getting into the rhythm of the year from the very beginning is important. I'm hoping to be able to spend some more time with students, uh, which I, is really always the best part of the job, and uh, spending some more time in classrooms. I love doing that. I think we'll have um, you know, plenty of uh, challenges, plenty of ideas coming forward in the next couple of years, but um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, it was funny. At the end of the year this year, I, I said, look, I'm not tired. I'm energized. I don't feel tired like I often do at the end of the year. Part of it is a change, part of it is just that I'm back here and there's so many great things and, and so many possibilities. Run here this They've run me around a little bit. But tour, it, you've got one more stop. Uh, Jackson, Hole. Jackson Hole. Somebody's got to go. Promote that. And yeah, yeah. If, well, if you're in Jackson Hole, let me know. I'll be happy to see you it's out there. August. Yeah, it's August. Yeah, it's first week of August and, um, you know, just in New York on Monday. And uh, But it's been so energizing to see people that uh, care about the school so much. Uh, it's great to be part of that kind of community. And you can learn more about the Room 212 tour uh, at sidwell.edu slash uh, town hall. Uh, I'm sorry. Just, uh, you can learn more about the, about know, the um, uh, Room 212 tour. Sorry, it's at sidwell.edu, and then there's a button there that you can learn more about um, Brian's tour there. We are at the end of our session here. Uh, Brian, I want to thank Thanks, you Doug. so much. Thanks, Good to I see really you always. Yeah, it. I appreciate and it too. I know everyone who is watching appreciates it. Thanks for coming, everyone. And there's going to be a uh, form uh, questionnaire that we're asking folks to fill out at the end of this. So hopefully you can uh, give your feedback to this. This, again, was our first online interactive town hall that we've had. I think we had close to 100 people. So we're really, you know, it was a real good experience, I think, for the school. Hopefully we'll do it again. And you can, as I said, learn about the town, about the uh, 212 tour on uh, sidwell.edu, but you can also watch a replay of this, uh, of, of this, of Brian's interview, uh, probably posted in the next day or two. So keep an eye out for that. And I want to thank all of you for participating. And uh, go Quakers, right? Go Quakers. Thanks. Yeah. Good job. We out? <laughs>